Welcome into this edition of the MTOM Podcast. I'm Paul Yeager at the Iowa State Fair. That is Mike Nag, Secretary of Agriculture in Iowa, of Iowa, for Iowa, all of in Iowa. Of, for, what is it? I like is it all of? that. Wait a minute. Oh, no, that, your shirt says something different. Yeah, yeah. You've been, you're in your second term as secretary. That's right. You served as a deputy. Um, so you have experience at the Iowa State Fair, which is where we're at. I do. Uh, you know, uh, now, uh, if you add my time as deputy secretary and then secretary, this is my 10th year of going to the fair every day. I love it. But, you know, I, it's a great honor. I, as, as secretary, uh, by law, the secretary of ag, the governor and the president of Iowa State University are represented on the fair board. So uh, I, I actually have a seat on the fair board. But are you a voting member? Uh, we, we are. You are. We are. My deputy secretary typically is the one representing me at the meetings, but we are a, we're a voting member, along with then the others who are, you know, elected uh, by their by the fair community all across the state. It's a it's I, I love it. It's been wonderful to learn about the back end of the uh, of the fair. What is your earliest fair memory? Oh, well, now, of the state fair or yeah, any fair? state fair. You know, well... Iowa State Fair. Iowa yeah, State sorry. Fair. So my sister was a was a uh, county fair queen from Palo Alto County, and we came down for uh, for when she was involved in that, and that's that's really when I can remember. We never we never came here to show. You know, I'm from northwest Iowa. That, you, uh, you, had to, you had to pack a bag if you were going to come to Des Moines, you know? And <laughs> so you, you have probably deeper ties as a kid to the Clay County Clay Fair. Clay County Fair. You know, we showed at the Palo Alto County Fair my sister, sister and brother and my younger sister and I, we all did everything, it just just like everybody did, all the 4-H things that you could do. But yes, I, I grew up going to the Clay County Fair okay. as being kind of the big, which is a fantastic, we have some amazing county fairs in this state, but and Clay now, County Fair is a good one. And now you have a tie to the Clay County Fair as the new CEO of the yeah. Iowa State Fair. And so for him to, to bridge, he's like, I was only going to take one job, and it was this <laughs> one. He, you know... Clay County Fair has got all the same pieces as the state fair. It's just a different scale, but Jeremy has had a great, great background, had a great career in the fair industry. He's doing a fantastic job here. We're outside the agricultural building, which is home to uh, horticulture uh, exhibits. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just saw some ears of corn. Uh, there's tomatoes and fruits and flowers. There's a thing called the butter cow. Uh, yeah, the Iowa that's State just a fair. little, just this you little know, thing. slightly iconic thing that happens. I come, I have been in this <laughs> this driveway more in in my career covering the fair than anywhere, and this is kind of a I call it a little secret area. There is a bathroom. Many people know it's been very uh -huh. busy back there, so a lot okay. of people know it. What do you do inside the ag building? Well, so this is where one we have two booths for the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship. One is in the ag building, and one is in the varied industries building. So in the VI building. We're the weights and measures people, so uh, you yeah. can come and get your official fair weight. Everybody loves Ooh. to weigh in. Ooh. You know, it's fun. People weigh in at the beginning of the day, the end of the day, the beginning of the fair, <laughs> the end of the fair. We're all about rate of gain here at the <laughs> Iowa Department of Ag, and so it is funny. People will unload their pockets and take their shoes off, and it's like, no, it, you just just get on the scale. Oh, but, uh, but here in the Ag building, we work with all the different commodity groups, and so we are showcasing you know, you know, today it might be uh, it, it might be pork, and tomorrow it might be dairy, and the next day soybean. Uh, so it's really a group effort. And then this year we're actually doing something special. We're we're launching Choose Iowa, which is a, a brand for Iowa made, Iowa grown, Iowa raised products, food and egg products. And so that's what our brand is this year. is all about. Uh, choose Iowa. It's next to the, you get your hard boiled egg on a stick, you okay. check out the Iowa Barn Foundation barn, and then you, you're in line for the buttered cow. So as if you needed another thing to do in the ag building. Hey, by the way, you talk about this being a secret area. Right around that corner back there, there's a replica of the tallest corn yes. stock, and it is huge. I always tell people, you should go see that. I mean, it, it is. It's kind of like tucked behind the ag building. You got to want to go there to see it, but it's it's just one of those little secret things that's kind of fun. Prior to you being secretary, I did a story on it, showing I up love at the it. fair. Isn't that that great? was part of my fair coverage for Iowa PBS. Okay, we're on a golf cart. This is, <laughs> we've called this many different things, but this is my way of getting you around the grounds. We're gonna okay. we're gonna travel a little bit. Do you hoof it or do you dry, ride much here at the fair? A little bit of both. You know, sometimes the practical reality is we have to get on a golf cart to get to where we need to go, which is a great thing. I love it. I want to be so busy here at the fair, but I uh, there are also days where it just gets too busy and you couldn't get a golf cart through uh, anyway, so you just get up and walk. A couple, which of, you probably couple of days need, ago need was the do. case. Yeah, yeah, well, that was true. Saturday was tough. We're coming up in an area that's pretty busy. I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour because you talk about commodity groups in Iowa. Yep. 
And again, this is the, we'll find out how, how much give this thing has or get up and go up a hill. And there everybody's you go. just kind of, you try not to hit anybody because then you make the news, <laughs> yeah, especially you don't when you're do recording that. live. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm impressed. You're, you're double, you're, you're doing uh, double duty here. As I have told guests in the past, I have said, uh, don't pay attention to me not paying attention to you <laughs> because uh, I am looking, I'm head on a swivel constantly to make sure. So we're going to do one of the most, the biggest sins is I'm going to do a U-turn up here. Here we we're go. We're going to talk about you got a, a nice big spot here to do it. In, I though. do, and I think, oh, of course, and there's a tow truck coming. <laughs> Let's see if we can get in front of him and her. We're going to find out if, as long as they don't move. I think you can make it. I oh, mean, no, they're no, moving. No, <laughs> we can't. Wow. I have never been involved in anything so violent as that. OK. And We're, it's all documented. And it's all documented. My bosses will love this. I'm also holding a camera, so Proto guy is going to be mad at me. Just a minute, go. We're in front of the brand new pork building. Yeah. Iowa pork is a massive part of this state. Um, how many times a day do you end up here? <laughs> and why has it become so popular in Iowa? It, it's a hub of activity over here, to be sure. Presidential candidates love to come here. I love to come and check in on folks. I'll get a chance to, to uh, flip uh, pork chops and burgers here uh, later this week. And, and of course, it's fun to take guests. You know, we've had visitors from uh, Uganda. Uh, uh, the uh, UK has been here. We're going to have the Canadians with us. You know, just it's fun. And, and it's iconic to come and flip you know, pork chops and, and do that. Pork industry is huge in this state. You know, we, and you know it, you know the stats, you know, we're number one in corn production and number two in soybean. But I always say that's not really what, that's not what makes Iowa special. It's the fact that we take that commodity basis and we add value to it. We feed it to something, I, ethanol plant, biodiesel, uh, uh, dairy, pork, egg, turkey, you name it. Uh, we turn that commodity crop into something higher value, higher value protein or a bio-based product. And so pork industry clearly is one of the, the, the lead drivers of the ag industry in the state. What percentage of people that come to the Iowa State Fair, so we're talking a million people, what percentage of them know a lot of what you're just talking about? Oh, you know, well, first of all, that's an important, that's, that's why I, I talk about this. This is an agriculture fair. Uh, the board is in, very focused on it remaining an agriculture fair. The, yes, there's other things. It's entertaining and you've got all kinds of experiences that you can have here, but at its core, it's an ag fair and it always has been and it always must be. This might be the most meaningful interaction that somebody might have with the ag community is at the Iowa State Fair. And, you know, it might be in the ag building getting your egg on a stick and trying to learn just a little something about that or you go eat at the pork tent and you you see some of the facts and figures. So, you know, uh, I think there's people that are heavy, general awareness that, yep, we're an ag state, yep, we, we do things like corn and, and, and pork, but what we wanna do is take whatever that knowledge level is and just go one level deeper. Each time we can just go one level deeper, where it's a good thing. I don't know, there's a stat, I believe it's, you know, I don't know if it's a stat, but that anecdote of, is everybody's just one or two, Yeah points removed from a farm, yeah. but quickly things can change. 20 yeah. years later, yeah. 30 years later, the story of agriculture is different. The ag, or the added value that you mentioned with the pork industry is something that I think some people just think, oh, it, it just stinks, or it's just, yeah. it's just pork chops. It's way more than that. This audience that might be one or two removed, even if they come to the fair, what do you hope could you give them a brochure when they walk in that they'll throw away? I mean, you give them a free egg, you give them this, you know people talk about the pork chop on a stick. I guess that awareness, you've, you've succeeded there and on those two items. You're, again, it's, you're trying to, certainly promoting those industries, but you are just through whatever, you know, you're, you're gonna get hit with it multiple times here at the fairgrounds. And again, you just hope that people do take, I always say, look, if, if we accomplish nothing more than just somebody understanding that a little better appreciation for where their food comes from. You know, we've, we've learned a lot about marketplace disruption, supply chain disruption. I wish we could banish that term, right? I take it out of the English language are you, are altogether. You throwing, are you throwing shade at our show? No, 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 going, no just, you know, supply chain disruption. And, and, but that can be flipped and you can say, but then 
isn't it important to understand where things come from and how much of what we rely on starts on a farm somewhere and think of all the hands and the people that are involved in that chain and uh, if, if we can accomplish that uh, if nothing else that would be a good thing but sure if we can go to the next level and say this is about economic value this is about safe food this is about look at all the innovation that occurs in agriculture those are all the things all i know is whatever we're doing we have to keep doing it and we have to even do more of it yesterday i drove by uh an oil company that was here. Yes. Call them Big Oil. Yeah. Is Iowa a state of big ag? We're, uh, we're an energy state. That, that's the first thing. I saw. I stopped and talked to the same folks. I said we're an energy state, and I think we ought to think of ourselves that way. Uh, you know, big, big, big oil, big, big energy. Uh, I, I, I don't know. You can call it what you want, but we're an we're an energy state, and that's certainly ethanol, biodiesel, renewable diesel, uh, sustainable aviation fuel is coming. Bio-based anything, bio-based everything is an opportunity for us. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we got, ag drives our economy, but that's just, that's just one core piece of it. Then you add on manufacturing, energy, all of the above, um, and, and all the surrounding businesses that are required to have successful agriculture. Like you could call California big tech. Yeah. The South, big oil. The Midwest, big ag. Is that how you make it as a uh, as an industry? When you you put big in front of whatever it is that you're working on? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I think it's true that. Uh, look, I, I I like to say, you know, when I and I've traveled this year, we've been to Japan and South Korea, Vietnam and Philippines for trade missions. I don't think I've ever had to explain to somebody that Iowa is an agriculture state. You it's have like it. People know it. They know it all around the world. And uh, we're known for what we do. We're known for our, our products, the quality of our products. I'm proud of that. And uh, but I think we're just, I think we're known for that. But we also want to make sure again that people understand that uh, uh, there's so much that goes into that, and we derive so much benefit from it. Every Iowan benefits from a strong agriculture. That's for sure. Just recent in the news, uh, attorneys general in Nebraska and Iowa renewing some of the legal battles over that biofuel yeah. availability year-round, there's always a constant churn. At what point does that stop? At what point does everybody just kind of realize this is the way it's gonna have to be? <laughs> oh, I've been praying that that would happen, but oh, you know, I think there's always, when you, what we're really at its core, what we're fighting for here is market access. Let consumers decide, but you have to have access to that market, meaning, it, you know, we want E15 availability year-round to consumers everywhere. We, let's forget this summer fueling season business. Let's make it available. Let consumers decide. Iowans have overwhelmingly voted with their pocketbooks. When they go to the pump and E15 or unleaded 88 is available, they buy it. And they have benefited from it. They've saved tens of millions of dollars just last year on buying that 15% ethanol blend versus the, the E10 or the, the uh, no ethanol blends. And so there, and then we just have to continue to talk, fight for market access, and then also talk about those benefits. Better for the environment, better for your pocketbook, certainly good for our ag economy. And I always say, but when you pump a gallon of, of gas that's got ethanol in it, think of who benefits. Thousands of people across the state of Iowa benefit when we have a thriving ethanol industry. Who benefits when you pump a gallon of pure gasoline, petroleum-based gasoline? It's not Iowa farmers that benefit. So I think uh, we just need to keep that perspective. Um, I'm hopeful that we can continue to get it right. You know that the administrations that they'll actually live up to what congressional intent was on the renewable fuel standard, which is to have a growing renewable industry sector. And here's the final, final piece. It's domestic, doggone it. And shouldn't we care about that? Domestic, renewable, that's, those are things that we should, we should all care about. To fuel the world, we need to be able to grow a crop. Yeah. It just rained when we started this interview. <laughs> Rain has been hard to come by. However, we have proven through genetics and seed improvements yeah. that we can still grow a ridiculously large crop with almost minuscule rain. Does that make your job easier or harder? <laughs> well, I get I get uh, lots of comments, as you can imagine, about whether it's raining enough or too little, or I think you get them. Oh well, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, I think it's it, it is so true that the last two three years we've had what's been true is that we've been dry. 
you know, yeah. you've got 100% of the state of Iowa is at least abnormally dry right now, and you've had significant persistent drought in some places. Somebody put it so well, last year I was in southern Iowa visiting with a farm family, and this woman had said to me, uh, the rain has been like manna from heaven, just enough, just when we needed it, never more yeah. than we needed. And I think what, it, it hit home because it's like we've, we've never, nobody would say they've had too much, but we've had enough and we've had timely rains. But it's also a testament to everything that goes into growing a crop. Yes, it's genetics, it's biotech traits, it's, it's precision placement, it's precision uh, fertilizer placement. It's all of that, it's better management and uh, all of that culminates in a more resilient crop. But, you know, a couple of years ago, we set a record for corn production in a dry year. Mm -hmm. We nearly eclipsed that last year in a dry year. And I'm really hopeful we're gonna have a, a there's gonna be some places in this state that have phenomenal crop uh, this year. And admittedly, there's some places that are gonna be, uh, the top end is off because of drought. We talk about the largest crop in Iowa is corn, soybeans. We have big crops. What about that farmer that wants to get into the land with 140 yeah. acres yeah. or somebody that is thinking, I want to do something different? At what point do you have to, in your role, juggle a beginning farmer yeah. who may not have access to the land like you want him to, and yet still a large industry that feed and fuels the world? Oh, uh, spot on. You know, we, and that's got to be a sustained focus. Look. That, We've got so many things going for us here, right? We've got natural resources, soil that's tremendously productive, um, all the supporting cast and characters that you need to be successful in agriculture. We've got them here. People want what we have. But at, its, at the basis, what makes us successful is our people. And uh, we, we've got to have more people coming to work in agriculture. We've also got to think about that next generation. And, and succession planning at the farm level is really important. But what if you're somebody who doesn't have even have a family connection? It's never been easy to start farming. Right. Never been easy to start farming. And I don't care if, if you've got the closest family connection. What about somebody that doesn't? Uh, actually, I'm really excited about the uh, Choose Iowa that we're launching, this idea that specialty crops or smaller acreage, higher margin, higher value, or maybe you're capturing more value by selling beef direct to a consumer processing locally trying to capture that more of that uh, that dollar i'm excited about that i think consumers want that they're looking for more local and uh, that that can actually be an opportunity for beginning uh, farmers as well so that land access and transition planning those things are really tough uh, uh, by the way you know we would historically say that livestock has been a really good entree for the next generation to get into a farm it's it generates revenue, cash flow, but of course the cost of building materials and financing these days that you can't, that doesn't work like it did a few years ago. Now that'll come back to, that'll come back to earth at some point, but right now that's a tough go. You are elected. You are part of a I party. Am. There is a push in what I think will probably be an issue in election land, especially in agriculture area, is about land ownership yeah. and who can own the land mm -hmm. and I've done two or three interviews of late with people who study land for a living who say foreign ownership is not the problem that the politicians are telling us that it is. I ask you in Iowa specifically where are the Chinese buying the land, yeah. where are the foreign people buying the land. I know there's Great Britons, I know that there's mm -hmm. uh, I know that there are athletes, mm -hmm. but where where is this an issue that we need to be paying attention to? You know, in the state of Iowa, well, I got to say that, that we had we had policymakers that had, were visionary. They they had seen ahead decades ago uh, that we didn't that, that we should have an opinion about it, that it was right to have an opinion about who held farm ground in the state of Iowa. And so there is a prohibition on the foreign ownership of farm ground in the state of Iowa. Uh, we don't have an issue in the state now. There are. There are things that we should make sure we're continuing to do to, to, to say that we can prove that or that we've got visibility to that. I mean, I think that is something that we should be, be thinking about, but uh, no, foreign, foreign ownership. And by the way, foreign investment in Iowa is not a bad thing in and of itself. We've it got, could prop up prices. Well, we've got great, uh, there's some wonderful businesses, uh, you know, uh, uh, South Korean companies, Japanese companies, uh, European companies that have a, a major footprint in, in the state of Iowa. And, and that's a good thing for us. Uh, so, but, but 
as a country, I think we can and should have opinions about mm -hmm. about that. And so what I would like to see is, I can, so I can say in the state of Iowa that we don't think that we have a problem with foreign ownership, Chinese ownership of farm ground. Uh, let's make sure that we can continue to say that. And then let's also be, I can't say that in other states. And you're seeing other states actually model uh, what, what Iowa has done. And I do think that this is a federal issue. And so I, I appreciate that our congressional delegation is thinking about it in that sense, that this is something that's important at the federal level nationally for us. You know, it's of strategic importance. Your yeah. land base, yeah. your agriculture. Okay, that's maybe the final thing I'd love people to know. You know, we, we benefit from U.S. agriculture, safest, most abundant, most affordable food supply in the world, hands down. As a people, we spend the least amount of our income on food. We get to do things like give to the church, save for retirement, pay for a child's education, buy a boat, buy a golf cart. Buy a golf cart. Uh, I'm going to move into the shade a little bit more here. Yeah. Uh, Keep going. But that's, that's, you start a business. Take risks. Those are things that we do because we aren't spending 50 or 60% of our income on, on food. And, and that is essential to the American way of life. It's essential to national security. So that's why there's that compelling reason for us to, to have an opinion, policies around that, and some restrictions or some rules around ownership. But in the state of Iowa, foreign ownership is not a, not a problem. But let's make sure we can continue to say that. So I discussed a couple of issues that I think are probably fairly big. What is the biggest issue you see facing Iowa agriculture and maybe agriculture uh, in the United States as a whole in the next, uh, let's go, two years? You know, I, I still think that this, um, it's, you would put it into a bucket of uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty. Nobody likes uncertainty in their business, and certainly at the farm that's true. Um, and that's got everything to do with Russian invasion of Ukraine and that spillover effect that surely impacts us. Uh, Ukraine's a, the breadbasket of Europe. They're a major exporter of grain. That impacts us. Yeah. So how, how do we see that resolution? You've got China making moves in the world sort of related to that, but. Uh, you know, how, how are they positioning uh, for, for what they want to do? We've got inflation that's continuing to impact and high cost of capital. It's the convergence of that uncertainty that's got me concerned. Mm -hmm. I, I think we need to, uh, you know, what I continue to see is, gosh, we need to norm normalize that or level out of that. And then, uh, you, you know, that, I think that's the challenge for us in the next couple of years. The overarching challenge that I'll continue to hear from folks in addition to that supply chain disruption sure, that I want to right. banish, banish from our language is it's still around people and and again making sure we've got the workforce that we need in ag. I had a conversation with an old kid I rode the bus with in Buchanan County who said those are those are old relationships they go way back right we pick up right where we left <laughs> off he has a small trucking firm he says I've got five trucks but only one driver yeah me yeah I said, well, you got all those yellow people that are available. He says, they don't want to work as such as, and then he started going into things in the trucking industry that he has seen as issues for him. Um, supplying goods, I mean, Iowa is one of those states where there's distribution centers and we're cross country roads. Yep. We have the north south, the east west corridor. Does that fall anything under your purview of, I need to pay attention, I need to, offer assistance to the governor when she asks? You know, we certainly do. Look, first of all, ag is a logistics heavy business, right? Well, I always say we, we move things to the farm, around the farm, and off the farm, and that's just the farm piece of it. And the other challenge that we have in ag is it's timely movements, right? You, if, if seed is a month late, that's, that's not going to work, you know? Um, and so logistics certainly matters, but we do have an opportunity as a state to be in the middle of that with, with uh, certainly the Mississippi River on one side, rail, uh, roads certainly, and, and that's something that we do think about and we, we need to continue to think about. And, and again, it, timely movement of goods, timely movement of food and ag products, critically important, and, and again, but it comes down to people, and I think that's, that's one of our great challenges. Farm labor? is yep. the seasonality of the yep. issue. Uh, you can't, there's no way to regulate what a farm does and say you need to provide. I mean, we had a hired man, several of them over the years. Labor, that has become a challenge. Is that, do you think, going to maybe reset some thinking on the size of some farms? Well, I mean, that 
there, there are there are practical realities that are associated with not being able to find labor, right? And it, and yes, I, I also think that it, it it could drive some innovation too. You know, you're thinking about autonomous um, uh, tractors and mm -hmm. driver. You know, I, I, that that seems like that has to come in some way to, to respond. So you're going to see innovation and then adjustments because again, what are you going to try to do? You got to manage your risk. Um, and if, you, if, if you've got a major risk of you can't hire enough folks, you have to de-risk that. And so I think, that, I think there are a number of implications for that. So there's no easy answer here. You certainly need immigration reform and work visas, programs that are predictable and frankly accommodate for what we need. You've got to attract people into ag. You've got to recruit people to rural areas. And then you got to plant that seed further out, those kids, you know, that we got to, like we're seeing here at the fair, you know, get them excited about and, and want to pursue an education in ag or pursue a career. But those are longer term plays. You got to play on all that, those yeah, levels. And you have issues of you don't have someone to teach FFA, well, agriculture, ag business oh, in a school district across the state. Every time I meet a young person who's going into ag ed, I just want to give them a hug and, you know, say, God bless you, thank you, because but, we need it so badly. But then they turn out in five years. I was at the Iowa Ag Educators Conference in late June talking to a person I had talked to for years who said, we had a stand-up years of service. Do you know what the number oh. of years of service was the over-under? The number? Eight. Oh, no. Well, Half were over, hey, half were under. Hey, guess what? They're really impressive people. And they uh, they go out there and they're, they're they uh, folks folks want them they recruit them they do and they do switch yeah. schools a lot and they find yeah. good districts so at that point do you go over to the Department of Ed and say what can I do to help we 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 do we we've, we've got we've got to think more about um, how to entice uh, more more folks to look at you know governor's done some things around you know more student teachers and uh, you know ag is just one piece of that yeah. right there's a bigger issue around teachers and. And uh, we ought to we ought to pay our teachers. We ought to train our teachers. We ought to uh, you know treat them right. And, and uh, you know uh, we want to make sure that those can be desirable jobs. Uh, you know for folks to uh, to get into. So again, that's that workforce challenge. Uh, everything from welders to teachers to truck drivers to farmers to veterinarians yeah. who want to work in the large animal space, uh, engineers, you name it. We need more people. But by the way, um, not a not an entirely terrible thing to when, when, why why are we needing so many people because there's so many opportunities there's so much potential there's so much growth that could happen out there so you know i i try to turn this into somewhat of a positive which is ag's not going out of style um we're not going to be the kodak film company you know yeah. that doesn't really exist anymore uh uh we're we're People need ag. They're gonna need ag. People all around the world need ag. Now that means we're gonna change with the mm -hmm. times, mm -hmm. but the demand is there and oh my, I always tell this to young folks, you know, could you think of a better reason to get up and go to work? Or can you think of a better cause to go to work for than, than truly the livelihoods and the, and the well-being of people all around the world? And can you think of a more uh, Iowa experience than we've just had in the last few minutes of we started in yeah. rain, the sun came out, the sun went away, it was misting and raining all at the same time. And I think we're going to get rain. And, and I think there's that, rain to the, yeah. to the east that I'm showing there that I flipped that camera around. As we were talking, I have to say, as I'm looking down the Grand Concourse, I'm seeing all those flags hanging off the, the, uh, the grandstand there. And look at the way the flags look against that dark sky. It's just beautiful. Hardest question. One event. You can only do one. Oh. Here. Here? Well, it, it's a little bit like Picking asking to pick your child. favorite child. We all but know, we know you we, have a favorite child. We all That's know we have point. one, but we don't tell anybody. <laughs> Do you if, have one and, and you my don't children, tell anybody? If my children are watching, they know exactly what that means. Yeah. Um, I, I, I will truly say that um, it's not just one of my favorite day of the fair. It's one of my favorite days of the year, and that's the Century and Heritage Farm. Program. Which is where we have uh, pulled you before, and I've watched that. My boss and I have watched that event, yeah. and I know people every year come and they're excited. Hey, we're getting the heritage this year. We're yeah. getting the century. Yeah. Uh, you are giving, you are honoring legacies in Iowa, uh, and I know that there's people that are care about that that watch our program because that are it's that one and two generation off the farm that still need to know what's going on the farm. Yeah, it, it's 
it's a, I mean, it, you, you, first of all, we, we want to make it special for uh, if you're if you're Adair County or, or Adams County or you're uh, Winnesheet County, you know, we, we want to make sure it's it's special for you. It's a long day. We'll do 400 families. Uh, we'll walk the stage this year. But you think about what it has taken for a family to hold a farm. World wars, pandemics, farm crisis. Yeah. The internet has come. You know, uh, all kinds of technology and innovation. Families have experienced. I had a family told me they'd bought the farm and it was hit by a tornado uh, oh. the following year. Think of it. And yet, that, there they stood. You know, 99 years later, uh. and all that has gone into that. And we should celebrate that tenacity and that that. Uh, just the endurance that frankly sometimes it takes in in life but uh what we what we love to do is hear the stories we've had four generations on the stage at once really I mean, think of it yeah three week old baby and uh um, i just kind of stood back and and watched and and uh that's just a cool thing to to see so uh i hope someday i get to cross the stage for a heritage farm i told the boys they have to drag me down here and Prop, prop me up. Yep. I said, "We're the. That's us. We're gonna. You're gonna drag me across that stage." But I sure hope that we uh, have the ability to do that. Mike Nick, Secretary of Agriculture in the state of Iowa. Thank you so much for the time. Absolutely. Appreciate the ride. Absolutely. Have Thanks fun for the, the rest ride. of the fair. <laughs> That'll do it for this installment of the MTOM Show podcast. I'm Paul Yeager. New episodes each and every Tuesday. You never know who will show up. <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs>